morning. Uh, yeah. Thanks to Jodhir sir and uh, the JF organizers for the opportunity. I'll be talking about diabetes and heart disease, particularly how, how to guard the heart in our diabetic patients. This is just to give you give us a visual um, um, appreciation of what diabetes does, does to our coronaries. The left side is a normal angiogram and the right side is a severely deceased, long-standing uh, diabetic patient's uh, angiogram. You can appreciate the degree of uh, macro and microvascular disease. Uh, the white represents macro process. I'll talk a little bit about treadmill test in diabetes, which I think is a very useful screening tool. So as we showed uh, the image earlier, this is a diabetic coronary, and you can see that there is both microvascular and macrovascular disease. And TMT is actually a very sensitive tool, but it cannot differentiate micro and macrovascular. If you have microvascular disease, all that you need to do is intensify medical management. The patient uh, falls into your secondary prevention category for which the management is more intensive. Aspirin is more useful, your lipid targets are more intense. If you have macrovascular disease, that is when a revascularization may be indicated. But TMT cannot differentiate these two. It is very sensitive and as a, it's a very good negative predictive value. As you know, the TMT is negative, there is a very good chance that the patient doesn't have vascular disease in the heart. But specificity for macrovascular disease is not great. But there are different variables that you can use. So if you start sending all positive TMTs for angiogram, then you'll end up doing unnecessary angiograms on a lot of diabetic patients. So you have to use a lot of common sense and variables to figure out who needs further workup. So degree of ischemia is useful, symptoms during the test is useful. And when to proceed to an angiogram is a very critical question to answer. Usually if the ischemia is only mild and the effort tolerance is good and uh, not much symptomatic intensification of medical management might be adequate. We have moderate to severe ischemia and symptoms. Uh, angiogram is useful mostly to ensure if this is only microvascular versus major epicardial disease which requires revascularization. If not, they have a higher risk of major uh, my, uh, myocardial infarction versus in the future. So TMT as such is not recommended by guidelines for asymptomatic patients, but then again the question of asymptomatic CAD is a little bit tricky. When to do a TMT, there is nothing in the guidelines, but probably it can be time related. Maybe after five years of diagnosing diabetes, depending on how well controlled they are based on symptoms, you can probably screen them using a TMT test. CT scans are increasingly being used to screen and diagnose either for calcium scoring as well as to diagnose overt disease. You get these very beautiful high resolution image of coronary arteries just with a CT is just a five minute uh, testing but involves uh, contrast and radiation as well. So coronary calcium scores, calcium we know is a, you know, um, atherosclerosis is an inflammatory process and calcium goes with it and calcium is a surrogate mar marker of atherosclerosis. The calcium score can be anywhere between 100, 100 to 400 or more than that. Um, less, and um, if you have a higher calcium score, there's a higher uh, chance that you have coronary disease. It is not a one-to-one -one, um, correlation, but it is still useful. Uh, again, if you have moderate amount of calcium, then again you can diagnose them with coronary disease and put them in the secondary prevention category, intensify medical management. Again, requirement for a conventional angiogram and revascularization has to be uh, thought, thought through more intensely uh, because um, calcium can be uh, present just with aging without atherosclerosis. Uh, calcium may be present in the um, outer layers of the coronaries which may not indicate uh, ischemia. Uh, so all those things need to be uh, thought through. Uh, along with the calcium score, you can obviously do an angiogram, and, which is, has a very good correlation with conventional angiogram in terms of detecting uh, a coronary disease. Uh, the images that you see here on the left is conventional angiogram, and the right is CT angiogram. Um, so calcium as such is a, a, a very um, a tough aspect as far well as revascularization is concerned because heavily calcified coronary disease is, is difficult to open up. Uh, this, what you see here, is what is called a rotational atherectomy. It's a micro drill which uh, drills out calcium within the coronary arteries. 
um, uh, to open up these vessels. Uh, so calcified coronaries require uh, a major high risk angioplasty or coronary artery bypass surgery for revascularization. Endorgan damage in diabetes, we know that glycemic control can modify your microvascular endorgan damage, which is your neuro, retinal, and nephropathy. But macrovascular um, endorgan damage, including MI, stroke, and peripheral disease, have to be managed beyond glycemic control. So we talked about diagnosing coronary disease, we'll talk about treating coronary disease and CV mortality reduction in diabetic patients. We know that over a period of time, we have learned that including insulin and the older OHAs do not impact CD mortality. Metformin was the only older drug which showed cardiovascular protection. And then since the uh, Rosicrucan saga, we have started doing CDOT trials in all uh, diabetic drugs, and which is why we landed with GLP-1 um, analogs and uh, SGLT2s. So GLP-1s, um, have, are the uh, one of the two molecules which has been shown to have a strong CD mortality reduction, primarily because of its anti-atherosclerotic effect. Uh, these are the various trials starting with the later Lira and then Sema, Dixie, and so on. Um, most of which have shown uh, a positive uh, CD death benefit as well as creepy maze reduction. This is the mechanism by which GLP-1 analogs protect the coronaries. Anti-atherosclerotic effect can be direct by modifying the endothelial function, uh, preventing lipid accumulation, decreasing vascular inflammation, and indirect effects include weight reduction, glycemic control, and blood pressure reduction as well. Plaque stabilization and anti-atherosclerotic benefits of GLP-1 analog is well studied. So it is not only coronary disease that diabetes causes, but heart failure as well, which is getting more and more appreciated lately with the advent of the SGL T2 inhibitors. Diabetic patients can have two types of heart failure. The systolic heart failure or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is a conventional heart failure uh, secondary to myocardial infarction, myocardial damage, LV dysfunction leading to heart failure. Probably the less appreciated and more common heart failure is a diastolic heart failure or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, usually secondary to what is termed as a metabolic cardiomyopathy or a diabetic cardiomyopathy leading to left ventricular stiffening diastolic dysfunction in heart failure. And usually there is a component of concomitant hypertension leading to left ventricular hypertrophy and left ventricular stiffness. This is the detailed mechanism of diabetic cardiomyopathy Predominantly, there is a metabolic derangement in terms of calcium and fatty acid handling, autonomic dysfunction, RAS activation, fibrosis, and so on, leads to diabetic cardiomyopathy, and coronary disease leads to LV dysfunction and heart failure with skin, uh, reduced ejection fraction. SGLT2s, the initial trials, all of them had a consistent benefit as far as heart failure hospitalization is concerned. EMPA also had CD death and maze benefit um, and the other molecules also had similar uh, results. And this is how SGLT2s prevent uh, heart failure. There is a reduction in interstitial edema. There is a hemodynamic benefit in terms of um, glycosuria and diuresis, cardio uh, kidney physiology, uh, atheliuresis and so on. Again, heart failure, we have a better understanding of HEF, HEF of uh, heart failure with preserved EF and the EF is more than 50. Heart failure with reduced EF with EF less than 40 and the mid-range uh, uh, heart failure. And what is interesting is heart failure with preserved EF has been a very tough entity to treat. The conventional pillars uh, which are used for heart failure, beta blockers, AC inhibitors, ARPs, aldactone and even ARNI have not been found to be useful as far as preserved EF heart failure is concerned. And it is in this context that the SGLT2s were found to be beneficial even in that group with, with the heart failure with preserved EF uh, patients. In the specific trial, the EMPA preserved and deliver looked at uh, EMPA and DAPA in the heart failure with preserved EF uh, patients and was found to be uh, beneficial. So SGLT2s are useful not only in the reduced EF population but also in the preserved EF population as well. 
and SGLT2 are needed to the guidelines at the 2A indication for heart failure with uh, preserved EF. Both aldactone and RB also are useful, but only, but only with the 2B indication. So this is a very nice concept. So we talked about GLT1 analogs and SGLT2 inhibitors. Both of them protect the heart, but in two different ways. SGLT2s protect the pipes or the coronaries. Anti-atherosclerotic prevents coronary disease, prevents myocardial infarction. SGLT2s, on the other hand, protects the pump or the pumping uh, function of the heart or the heart failure aspect, prevents heart failure and treats heart failure both in preserved and reduced infection fraction. Um, so the indications and the, and the benefits are, uh, are slightly different, but both are cardioprotective. One prevents atherosclerosis and MI, the other prevents um, uh, heart failure. And both of them have made it into the uh, uh, guidelines um, as well. Oftentimes, what is ignored is um, basic uh, treatment, cardiovascular treatment in diabetic patients, particularly your aspirin, statin, and blood pressure control. Um, there is only a weak recommendation for primary prevention usage of aspirin, slightly stronger recommendation for secondary prevention. Secondary prevention is when you already have the, uh, diagnosed atherosclerotic disease or myocardial infarction. Um, and there is a, a difference here because if you diagnose, well, we talked about TMT and coronary calcium scoring. So even if the patients are not very symptomatic, if those are positive, you will probably put them under the secondary prevention um, uh, packet and then treat them more aggressively. Lipid targets in diabetes, again, primary prevention with moderate risk, your LDL should be less than 100. High risk, LDL less than 70. Secondary prevention, the LDL target is almost even more aggressive, it is less than uh, 55. So depending on, so this is where the importance of primary and secondary and the diagnosis of asymptomatic coronary disease is important because your treatment goals are also different. Majority of diabetics are uh, hypertensive and hypertensive contributes with heart failure preserved EF. And uh, previously the goals were slightly more aggressive, now it is 140, 90 is the goal, is the uh, is when we should treat, goal should be less than 130-80. Elderly population, because of risk of labile hypertension and, and postural hypotension, uh, a target is less than 140. And ACE and ARB are the preserved drugs because of additional nephroprotection. Thank you.